Six weeks of consecutive higher high closes here is exactly what anyone would want. Now we're at all time highs. If you look at the technicals here, they look amazing. Now we can always get into the fundamental side of this, what's driving the market, and we will get into some of that. But if we start with the basics, look at something like an RSI and see how the RSI is starting to open up a little bit right in here, starting to push over, widen up. This is exactly what you want to see. We're hitting highs and we're nowhere near up here. Now, we have this negative divergence that happened here, and I'm sure everybody saw that, and I'll get comments on it where you can see right here. But the issue is you went to the neutral line and you held the neutral line, which is exactly what you want to see. And we could talk about this upper channel, but really what we should be focused on is, are we going to wind up heading back up? And this is kind of telling you, yeah, that's kind of where we're heading now. One of the major things I always look for is where are we on the band, Bollinger Bands? Like, am I, am I way ahead of where I should be? And this is where it gets super interesting. So the yellow is your standard deviation. And then the first set of bands is a one standard deviation. The second set that I have set is your second, and then your third is your third, right? I mean, you get that, okay? So if you don't know how these work, it's relatively simple. 67% range is really that first standard deviation. Then you have a 95%, and then you have 99.7 on the third. And what that's really saying is, hey, you should be in that range. And usually what happens if you get to the third or you pop out of the second, you'll usually pop back in, or you have to wait for the second to catch up. That's the easiest way to use it. Or if you break down like you did here, and you're touching the third rail, you can kind of go, oh, okay, well, that's interesting. Also, you use that line, you would use the median line to determine, hey, are we negative or positive? I mean, if you use just something as simplistic as that on the bands, it would keep you out of a lot of trouble. I mean, if you really look at that, you never broke the band. And then when you started to break the band, that was pretty much it for it, wasn't it? Uh, until it wasn't, then you can just kind of see how it starts to flip over time. But it takes time to develop. The point I'm getting at here is we're not really at this upper, upper level. You've, you're at the same level riding the same wave that you've really been riding since November 23, which is that second standard deviation. You come back, retest, second, retest the line over and over again, and you're holding. Now, what, what's important about this is it's telling us nothing's really changed here. So why we're getting into the election, the wars, inflation, blah, blah, blah. Like we're finding all these reasons. I'm listening to all the comments. We're finding all these reasons to find a way to, to not be in the market. But at the end of the day, the market's going higher. So we can either trade what's in front of us so we could find reasons to fit our thesis on, quote, why the market's wrong. One pays the bills. The other one will make you feel good about yourself. I'd rather pay my bills. So if I look at something like this, it makes us want to dive into this a little deeper. And we're going to get into some of the fundamental reasons behind this. Now, what I'm showing you now is just the third standard deviation, which is ultra extreme on a weekly. And I'm leaving the line in. And below, what we're going to see is just rate of change. And rate of change is exactly that. It doesn't matter to me if rate of change is going up or down. All that matters to me with rate of change is that you're above the neutral line. Here you are, you tested that 20, and then you flipped the next week and you held. That's all you need to know. That's it. That's really all you need to know here. And from there, you can just see how we acted and how we've been going. Now, if it comes down and starts going sideways, we don't really care because all we're looking for is rate of change. But what I'm pointing out is you're not at some extreme reading here either. You weren't at some extreme reading yet on rate of change here, you are also rather on RSI. And I think that's very important. You're not at some extreme reading here. Now, are there things that are on a daily that you might have to keep your eye on? And the answer to that is there's a couple things and we should talk about them. Now, the first thing here is the five days, the 20, the 50, and the 200. And these are the symbols and anybody can do this. And I think it's really important to get that. So why? Why is that important? Because if you want to look at what's going on in the world, just say, hey, are we really overbought or are we really oversold? And what I have found is that if all of these are aligned, you, you might have an issue you're getting overbought. Now, on the short term, we're at 59, so we're not really overbought on a short-term basis. Meaning, if 90% of these names on the five-day are above their moving average, we usually get some small pullback. But we're not seeing that. On the 20, you're at the 68. Now, some people would say, oh, we're at 67, 68 here, and we were at 90 here, so, you know, we're setting up to pull back. Okay, well, you've been setting up to pull back since August. How's that going, right? So you want to use these for what they're for. You don't want to go and find things to fit your narrative. In other words, get the right tool. This tool is to tell you, are you overextended? And you're overextended when you're up over these levels. Using this on a relative basis versus what happened here. Someone brought this to my attention the other day and I went to explain it to them and I figured I'd do this in the video. That is a nightmare. There is nothing relative about here to here because you have seasonality and a whole list of other things that are going on in the world, two wars, energy moves, 
to, to do that. What you want to do is look for the readings to be the same. For example, you're up here in that 80 range on the 200 day moving average. Well, if we were to use that on a relative basis, you've been up here in January, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It doesn't matter. What you're looking for is them all to be grossly over all at the same time. And when you see that, it's a bell. Because now you're at a level where the short and the long and the medium term guys, they're all looking at the same thing and going, okay, we can't all be over 90%. Not every name can be over 90%. And that does become a bell. There are some others. This is the probably the absolute worst one to use. And I'll show you why. So people use this fear and greed and go, oh, people are greedy. So we, we, you know, we got to watch. When it gets to that extreme greed, we got to get out. Okay, so last week you were at a 74. Previous close was 71, right? So... If you look at the market and you look at how long you've been in greed, and I'll show you that in a second, if you paid any attention to this or when it's an extreme greed and you got out, you have a problem. Now, there's a, there is something and there is a way to use this, but more for bottoms because what you're looking for is exhaustion. But to go out there and say on the greed side that there's something that's going to tell you you're topping, I don't think there's anything worse than this. If you have something worse, please drop it in the comments. But if you were to use this to get out, take a look at what would have happened. And the reason I'm showing this is because of your comments. So when you guys ask me about things in the comments, I do pay attention. I do try to respond to them. Here's extreme greed right up at this level right here. And we can see that. And if I took from here, which would looks like you're about you know November on from that October, November, December level, and we just said, okay, well, we're in that pocket right here and you can see that 75 right here and then you see the 50 from that on so you'd say between 70 to 75 okay and you would look at that area and go okay well let's call that December and we'll say we this was November moving into it and then it ends in April now what's so pertinent about this is what did the market do from December 23 to April 24. And what we'll do is we'll say this is November, which it is, and then we'll just take December from here and we'll just go and take a look at this and say, okay, well, from December over, from that point on, and then you just go to April, okay, and then from April. All right, so that's what following the fear index and greed index would have kept you out of the market. As you said, we're in extreme greed, I'm not gonna buy. So the next time that somebody posts that, Right. anywhere. You could just send them that and go, well, this is what happened at extreme greed. The other way to use this is that's not when you use it. And I'll show you how you should or and how you can use it. But if you looked right here, people are going to say, well, you're in extreme greed. And you're going to say, well, thank God. Now the market's finally really going to get going. If you think about it logically, if you're in extreme greed, it means that you have net buyers. You're just trying to get out when they get out, right? And there's a way to do that. I'll show you in a second. But to go there and say, well, we're in extreme greed right here. We've been there for two weeks. So it's any day now. Is it? It's any day? Okay, because this went on for what? Five months? Okay, before this came to an end. That's, let me show you how you can use this. There are two ways to use this effectively where it can actually tell you what's going on. And as a trader, your job is to always look for change in trend. That's your job. You're trying to figure out where we're going to see a change. Therefore, I can get in because we're going to have price movement either up or down. So we would all agree that 75 is not when you sell. Because if you did that, then you missed the single greatest move out. What you would note is that extreme greed into greed, which would put this at a 63. You can't highlight it here, but I'm just going to show you that that is an actual three. And this is that 75 level. Once you get from extreme greed to greed and you drop that way and that sediment changes, what you're doing is picture having a balloon that is filled with air and then you let a little bit of the air out, right? That's what happens. And once that starts happening, it's like a room where somebody yells sell and then everybody just goes for the exits. That's what you tend to say. So it is the movement from extreme greed to greed, if you wanna use. The other thing is, anytime you're in greed, anytime at all that you are in greed, and you start to see this, and you start to roll over, pay attention to it. And you can see that right here, and you can see that right here if you go and take a look at the chart, which we will in a second, and here as well. Any of these moves where you went up into that area in August and September, when you get to greed and then you roll over, again, it's the roll over that gets you from greed to neutral. But once you get to greed and you drop or extreme greed and you drop, that's where this you can look at this and say, okay, there's something to it. But if you're just going to stay up here, all that's telling you is that, hey, people are really greedy right now and they're willing to pay up. And you can see that a little bit in the market right now, can't you? The other way to use this, and we'll clean this off so that you can take a look at this, is you see these two lows right here? Anytime that you're near extreme fear, what this is actually telling you, what it's truly telling you, is that there's nobody left to buy. So when you start to see extreme fear like you did here and here and here, that is a much cleaner reading. Right? And usually what I like to do is see the extreme fear and then see it go into fear. You're looking for those changes. But 
extreme greed is not a reason to sell. Quite the contrary, it's a reason to actually buy and the data supports that. So this to me is something that you can utilize if you know how to use it correctly. And right now, you should have a good understanding of how to use this. You can always just go to the CNN website, Fear and Greed, and just use this for yourself for free. And as I stated that I would mark this off, what you're going to see here is really clearly, just go look at that graph and you can see April and you can go see August right here. And if you wanna look at these little peaks that are right here as well, they're your little greed peak. And you can kind of see where you peaked out a little bit there and sold down a little bit. They were when you went and had greed and then rolled over. And these are, of course, when you had extreme fear. That, that is a way that you could get something from it. And quite frankly, I don't even like using it from greed to neutral, you can. There's, there's much better things that are gonna give you a signal. But extreme greed to greed is probably a pretty strong signal from my standpoint, but the best signal is just the fear readings. They're, they're absolutely glaring. It's like a MACD histogram. If you ever use MACD histogram, use it at the bottom, not at the top. It's, it's, it's much more significant. Now, one of the best things, in my opinion, to understand where you're at and to get, understand if you really are overbought or oversold and are we gonna roll or not roll, is just McClellan summation. And you can do this on TradingView or wherever else that you wanna do it. And this is just the New York Stock Exchange composite and that, that's how I would do it as well. But really what you're looking for are extreme readings. So I'm gonna squeeze this down for here for a moment, just to open this up and then you'll see what I'm talking about. I'm looking for those extreme readings over something like a 500. And then usually that can give you some indication like, hey, we're a little toppy and we might start to roll. And then from there you look for something, but I'll show you, but let's mark that right there. So you can see the levels here, August 22nd, some of these levels from that mark, okay? And what you're looking for from them is then you're looking for the cross. So once you have that denoted, what you'll do is you'll look for this cross and you'll see it, like you can see it right here. You can see it here, but that doesn't really count because I wanna be over that level. You wanna be near the 500 to really be overbought and then roll. And when you're over 500 and you're overbought and you go correlate this with anything in the S&P, for example, it's pretty pretty obvious that you're, you know, what's gonna happen there and that you have kind of an issue and you can see it here as well. Um, and it doesn't mean that you're going to stay down, but it does mean that, hey, you know, we're getting a little toppy there. So you look at this and you're like, okay, well, do we have an issue here? Or don't we? Not really, not yet. And the thing about it is this will start to roll when you start to have an issue. So I don't really see anything out there yet that's glaring. Doesn't mean you can't get some kind of event and you have a big event coming with the election coming up. How are people going to position ahead of that? I think it's pretty obvious how they're going to position going into it unless something changes. But I would use McClellan summation. If anything, we're broadening out. And what we're really doing with this video is just taking an in-depth look at what's going on technically in the market. We're going to get into some more than nitty gritty in a bit here. But what we have in front of us are new highs, new lows on the NASDAQ. And I think it's really important to get because I don't think a lot of people truly understand what's going on under the hood. So you can see that, and I actually have it set separated out so you can actually see the amount of new lows and the amount of new highs. And what you're gonna get here is pretty clear. Even from this level, even if I don't take that and you just kind of come across, you're not hitting as many new lows. I mean, not not really even close to it. And then when it comes to the you know the new highs, it's, it's pretty obvious. And you can see it right here, right? So I look at this and say, okay, well, we're hitting new highs. We're not overbought on really any major metric out there and it, it's actually getting stronger on the RSI on the weekly, but this is the NASDAQ. So what we'll do is we'll break it down. See, this would be troubling. This would be more troubling to me if I was making lower lows. Like if I had stuff like this where we're, we're spiking and then we're making the low and we can't find ground and then, okay, well, we got some issues. We're trying to rally, we're not able to rally, but if I'm hitting highs and we're not hitting lows, it's very difficult for you to look at the NASDAQ, even though I have this core area right up here that I just can't get over, which is that July 11th area, I keep struggling with it. We're trying to make it support, it looks like up here, but we keep struggling with it. So we're really gonna have to see how that plays out. And it is an issue for me, but I, I don't see us, you know, I don't see us falling apart here, guys. So, you know, we'll have to see how that goes. As a matter of fact, what we're doing is we're fighting that area over and over again, that close, and now you've kind of made a decision. And a lot of people were looking at this and thinking it's bearish. You're closed in the same spot three times. It's not bearish. Like if I closed here three times and then broke, I get it. But if I'm closing here three times, even though they're ugly bars, it's telling you that you're trying to flip this level, right? So let's take a step back on this so you can just see where I'm going with this. So when you see that, it's it's really hard to say, well, yeah, that's really bearish. No, you keep respecting it over and over again. And I think that you're silly to not pay attention to that. So I would pay attention to it. Not that you're silly, but I, you are. You got to pay attention to it. All right. So that's the NASDAQ and you can see the highs here. Let's take a look at the S&P. Now the S&P is hitting highs and these are the highs that we're hitting and we have no lows. And this is broken 
broken down to where you're taking them out. And what I mean by that is they're, they're not net numbers. You can actually see the lows and see the highs. So you have 500 names there and you start going through them and going, wait a minute, you're telling me like 80? Yeah, that means some of these names are hitting new highs like every single day. And we're sitting here waiting for this to end. So if I come back through this, and I look at October and I go, well, yeah, I could see why you could look at these new lows, right? And be concerned or why you'd be here. Okay, maybe you got washed out. But when you start seeing all these new highs and all we keep talking about is, oh, we're gonna crash, we're gonna crash, we're waiting for this, oh, extreme greed. You're not seeing what the market's doing, right? It's important to look at what is actually happening when we have these dips. Are we hitting new lows? Not really. When we had this pullback, how many names hit new lows in the S&P? 18. If you're seeing this kind of stuff, right? And this is where we had that trend and change. Remember that right here? We had that big change. That's when the Fed did what they did and said, hey, we're not gonna raise rates anymore. But overall, you're looking at this on the S&P and saying to yourself, yeah, this looks pretty good. This would be a healthy market. If you didn't look at anything else and you just looked at the technicals, right? Sometimes you can't see the forest of the trees. So sometimes it's nice to just actually say, hey, what's happening? And then what's interesting here, is same thing, this New York Stock Exchange. And then you just keep looking all these dips and all we're doing is making more highs you're actually broadening out you're making more new highs and you're actually hitting more or less less lows and you're going higher you're broadening out as this continues i think that's really important especially if you look at the sectors now one of the graphs i love especially this time of year is to look at smart money dumb money and the reason for this is because it tells us exactly how people are positioning themselves going into the quarter but if you are new here please note that we don't refer to this as smart and we do not refer to this as dumb what we refer to this as institutions and this is retail institutions and retail and the reason for that is simple. This is calculated, smart money is calculated by what institutions are doing based upon those different ways of tracking that through the futures market and dumb money is really tracked, let's just say through ETF or small lot investments and options where obviously large blocks and sweeps are done through smart. This is where it gets super interesting because what the market tends to do or institutions tend to do is sell when they think things are getting expensive Okay? And then they buy when they think things are getting cheap. What that will do is it does create a dynamic. And what that dynamic looks like, really what you're looking for is a set of jaws. And now those jaws are not common at all. Matter of fact, what I did here is just on a five-year chart, you will see you can have it from here. And we can talk about obviously the $1.7 trillion that was injected in the market that created this set of jaws, which is what? When you have dumb money or retail, is way more invested than institutions and then institutions come in behind it and then you have the convergence right here which eventually will lead to some kind some kind of top if it continues but you need that to continue right the markets the, the way the markets work with the retail is retail has the attention span of a gnat so they want to get out of the way where institutions would look at something here and be fully maxed saying this is cheap all i have to do is stay in it for a year institutions are like i just need enough money for tuesday to go buy some hot pockets right and so you can kind of see how they view the world versus where institutions are completely maxed versus how retail's just puking everything at the bottom and this is one of the reasons why smart money dumb money gets its name because they're completely puked out retail down here and then up here this is where they're completely maxed but there's more to it than this because what retail does is tell you what side of the market that you really want to be on it's no different really than when you look at something along the lines of the extreme greed like why don't you want to buy when everybody's buying what you don't want to do is just not be there when the market stops if the music just turns off you just want to be out the exit but if you look at these particular periods in time we start to get these jaw-like patterns. It becomes very clear like, hey, I, I really wanna pay attention to this area. Now, again, does it work every time? No, it depends on how fast retail is gonna get skittish. If retail gets super skittish like it did here in July, and this was obviously when we thought that Japan was gonna raise rates for the first time, that's when that happened, uh, and they get super skittish, well then it's a completely different story. But if they're not that skittish and they take their time and institutions catch up, after the jaws are formed, that's really what you wanna start looking at. And that's exactly what you have going on here right now. So while people are out there saying, oh, well, we're too high, extreme greed, as we talked about earlier, extreme greed is good. It's good for us. Greed is good for us to trade. It, it just is. You don't wanna buy when everybody's selling unless you're looking out like months or years, right? If you're a Momo trader, a momentum trader, you wanna buy when everybody's getting in. 
And you just don't want to be there when the music stops. That's why when people look at RSI and they say it's overbought, it's very clear to me that they really just don't know, have any idea how to use that tool, right? You want to be in when everybody's in, just don't be there when it ends. It's very, very simple. And if we just broke this down on a three year for a second and just zoomed in a little bit, you can see them pretty clearly right here. And some of these, you're going to see that inverse. Jaws, right? And that is kind of marking a different kind of pattern, okay? And it doesn't always work. I want to be really clear about that. You know, I want to be very, very clear about that. It does not always work. For example, how you're sitting right here, right? If you get something like we talked about in July, and all of a sudden the market's going to panic over something, which it did here because we thought that, that uh, Japan was going to raise rates, that's a different story. If you see the panic, you have an issue. Retail panic leads to the market dropping, period, because institutions, what they will do, and this is why it's important to change your thesis on whether this is smart money, dumb money to institutions and retail, because what retail tends to do is overreact, right? And when they overreact, look what happens, okay? It gets fast and institutions just step out of the way. That's all they do, okay? And then if you look right here at this and you can just see, look, and then, oh, we're gonna go just sideways. All right, well, we're gonna start buying. Well, look what you get. And then wait, while people are waiting for this to turn here, and you can see the little inverse jaw set up right here, look what we wind up with. So retail is buying, but it's extreme greed. So I gotta get out of the way. Well, if you, again, to tie this to previously what we were just looking at, see all this stuff's connected. And once you start understanding that, you can start using this to your advantage. But if you were getting out when you had extreme greed or when we're overbought, if, if for example, here and here, or retail's way overbought, just look at the amount of money that you're leaving on the table. It's absolutely staggering. And if we zoom in here on this year, I think you can see where I'm going with this, hopefully. And of course, I always like your comments and just please let me know what you think of this. But if we took from that level on where we did this in November and we go from there, and let's not forget, there's also the, you know, there's the macro events, the fundamental events. And we're gonna do a little more fundamental research on this channel. I got asked to do it because I don't think a lot of people are explaining to newer members or newer traders what they're supposed to look for on conference calls. I don't see a lot of that being done. So I'm gonna give you some examples today on how we knew what was going on with Netflix. You can watch Thursday's video again, and I explained some of it. Um, and again, for those that are newer, these videos are all linked together for the week. So if that's of interest, you're gonna to wanna to subscribe because we follow through everything. Just very candidly, this is not mine. This is Sediment Trader. I do subscribe to them. I think they do a really good job of collating data that quite frankly, I don't wanna spend the time on. Uh, but if we look at this, we're seeing the same exact setup. How's this gone for us? Now, what we don't wanna see is, you know, them get, them get skittish and them being retail. As long as we don't see that, we're fine. So we'll continue to monitor this. And I would also suggest that you look at that CNN fear and greed, but learn how to use it correctly. Not how everybody wants you to use it, but how you can actually make money off of it. Now, I do want to show something else that I look at a lot. I want to see what institutions are doing. And particularly what I always look for with institutions is I want to see what they're doing at the end of the day on. That's my big thing. Like if someone said, well, tell me the one thing to look at. Tell me what happens on a Friday in the last half hour and I can tell you what's going on with the market. And I'm gonna explain why in 30 seconds here. Pension funds, if they wanna sell a million shares of Apple and they only sold half a million shares of Apple during the, the week, so it's Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and they have half a million left, by Friday, they will tell that guy, whoever their trader is, you have to get out. And that's why on Fridays you'll see these extreme moves or hey, you need to get me in. You only gave me half of what I need. I need exposure to this or hey, I need out of this, okay? Those adjustments on Friday, the last half hour, whether it's the market, whatever you're, you're focused on, and most options, they're placing those at the end of Friday, if, especially when you have the OPEX like we did on Friday. So you always wanna look at that, and I'm gonna give you a really clear way to see what's going on there on the option side. I'm gonna show you a way that you can find this stuff out for free, so just stay tuned for that. Um, I see a lot of these services, there are some decent services out there. I don't think they do a good enough job quite frankly, on showing you how to just say, hey, what's what's important and what's not. So I wanna show you a real quick way to do this. It'll save you a lot of time. But if you look at what's going on here with smart money, and this is 20 years. Now this is the smart money index, and this is calculated very differently. But I just wanna show you the smart money index is at all time highs. See, I actually believe that if you look at the journey that we're going through here on Wall Street, we're still in that disbelief phase. And I'm not gonna go through all that right now, but. People do not believe in AI. People think it's, you know, snake oil, I guess, or whatever, but they do not believe in it. If you look at what Freddie Fingers is saying on Twitter, they're not they're not swallowing it hook, line, and sinker, not like they did those NFTs, right? So the idea that we're at the tail end of something, it's just not accurate. 
So I, it, that's where my head is. And I've seen these cycles over 25 years. Uh, I've lived them. Believe me, I, I remember what the 90s were like in 2000. I, I've seen these cycles. But institutions are telling you that they feel very different about this. And you're like, okay, well now I have no idea what I'm looking at and we're getting there. So I always appreciate your comments. I always appreciate you sharing these videos and, and subscribing to the channel. It does help me greatly get the message out. I purposely don't run ads and I'm trying to cover stuff that I feel will help you get better uh, and learn. So that's the whole purpose of these videos, information and education on how I view the world and hopefully it can help you. But you need to know what you're looking at. Every indicator that you're looking at RSI, Momentum, MACD, whatever you're using. If you can't explain it, you shouldn't be using it. You should understand how they're calculated because you might use it differently. Now, this is popularized by a guy called Don Hayes and he does a really good job of this. I would do it a little differently, but I'm not gonna get into that. Um, but what he's doing is he's calculating the index to subtract the performance of the cash index during the first half hour of trading and add the performance during the last hour. So what he's saying is retail doesn't have a clue. Okay, so if retail's up, the market's actually going down. And then what he's saying is that what's really happening during the last hour of trading is the most important. There's actually graphs and studies done by institutions, and I actually look at one pretty regularly, that all I'm doing is looking at the last hour of trading. I'm literally looking at the S&P in a graph form for the last hour, and it will, it'll tell you a lot. For example, let's say Smart Money Index closed at 800. The first half of the trading day gains. So in other words, retail's buying five points. Then we ignore what happens to the last hour. And during that last hour, we lose eight points. What's gonna happen here is that difference of 13 points. But you're gonna subtract what retail's doing, and then you're going to subtract what institutions are doing, right? Remember dentist's favorite time of day, 2.30? Right, from then on, last hour, last hour and a half, you get it. And then you can see that you'd be at 787. This indicator has no hard and fast rule. And I do agree with that to an extent, but, if we're going up and that's going down, you need to get out of the way. And if if the market's going down, but that's going up, even the last hour, if that's going up and the market's going down, that's more long-term, you wanna pay attention to that. Now, this is where it gets super interesting. Most people will wonder, why would I go back 20 years to show you that? Well, now you know how it's calculated. Now you know why you wanna go back 20 years. And hopefully you can pick that up. But if you look going back, let's just do 10 here for a second. And go, okay, well, we're clearly over that level. And that was the peak level that we showed you over 20 years. And then we would go here and say, okay, well, here's the five-year graph. And hopefully you get where I'm going with this. But zoom back down on them. I'm not going to have time to edit this and drop that. You can see the sources are right here and where, they, where they're getting that data from. Now let's take a look at this three year. Okay, so if you're not getting what I'm putting down, when we go back and we go back to the 20, and you look at this from a three year standpoint, and you see the breakout, and now look at where all this started. And hopefully you get where this is going. But if not, we're gonna get you there. So see that level right there? Okay, we all know what that is, where we saw the turn. Now what was that turn? That was the Fed. And this is why I always talk about this stool and you're like, there he goes again, talking yeah, we're on about a stool. And for a second, yeah, we're gonna talk about it. And the reason for this is so that you get it, because I think it's really important. When you're here as a trader and you're up on this level, this is where you're sitting as a trader and this is where you're making all your decisions. All your decisions are predicated upon a leg. That leg, in this case, is going to be a macro event. That macro event tells us very clearly what is going on. That tells you what is the Fed doing. And in this case, that's the macro event. That, it could be a war, it could be anything, but that is a macro event. So the Fed on that day changed what they were we're doing and said so we are no longer raising rates we're done that's that move and then of course you have the fundamental side of the market and the technical side of the market for those that are newer the way that i view this is simple this is where we trade and sometimes when you're sitting at the bar or i don't know what kind of stool this is some kind of weird milking stool i guess but if you're looking from that standpoint you have to go what who, when, what did they do, who's affected by it, right? You have a war, then it's the shippers and the tankers and oil, right? What did they do? They cut rates, okay, who's affected by that? Home builders, et cetera. And then, okay, the technicals tell us when to get in. That's why this is so important. And once again, it's your comments that are making you explain why this data is so important. So you can see the change here and you can see how we're moving. And I understand you're probably going, okay, well, where, where are you going with this? I'm gonna take it back to this graph so you can get it. And this is where the, it, it's really important. So this is where you are. And this is where we were that entire time in 2022, right? All down in here where retail and institutions were kind of battling back and forth. And then we have a macro event, boom, something hits. Do you realize there's no period in time 
since this was has been formed, and it goes back 20 years, it's as far back as it goes to here, where retail was selling and institutions were buying consistently since November 23. There's no time in history on this chart where you've had institutions buying more at the end of the day in that last hour than you've had retail selling. And we're out here saying it's going to be a top. And meanwhile, all we're seeing is retail getting out in the morning, tracking it around, and institutions getting in. It's up to you to figure out what side of this you want to be on. This is not something you can look at and make a decision about on a Tuesday or a Wednesday. But if you're looking at this and you're looking at the past year, year and a half of what the S&P has been doing and you've been betting against the market since here, you're literally acting like retail. You're selling in the first half hour and you're watching the institutions buy at the end of the day. And you can see how that graph completely mimics what the S&P is doing. And it's still going on and yet people are still fighting it. And that's why I keep saying we're in the state of disbelief. Now, where this ends and how it ends, music always stops. Nobody knows. But to try and predict that right now, I think is a losing game. I think you need to look at this and just follow where the money's going. Let's get to it. See, it's my belief that the market is probably one of the most inefficient things out there. And the majority of people believe that there's actually a level of efficiency to the market. You watch these people with the random walk theory say so you can't outperform the S&P. It's a bunch of nonsense, quite frankly. It's a great way to just steal the herd directly into their index funds. Uh, and that's why it's promoted, quite frankly. Uh, but it's just not true. If you do the basic knowledge, just basic everyday knowledge, and you learn some of this stuff, you can grossly outperform. It just, it's just a fact. Um, anyone that says differently is just delusional. I mean, why would Buffett do what he does? He would just, oh, I'll just buy the S&P, but he's out there every day buying stocks. Why is Icon doing? Why, why would they do it? They wouldn't. They would just buy, right? But these people actually do make money doing what they're doing, uh, and they consistently outperform. Uh, both of those guys have absolutely crushed it, but and consistently over the S&P. So the idea that someone else can't do it and they are miraculously gifted is just, you know, a level of delusion that the world wants you to think. So they can help. I'm not good. Um, if you look at Netflix, for example, how how efficient was this? Okay, if we take a look at Netflix and the move out of that, was that efficient? The entire time you could have bought here, how efficient was this? It wasn't efficient. Okay, this is an exact example of something being in inefficient. What we think is going to happen versus what happens. Okay. And that is that level of reflexivity that I talk about a lot. Uh, you can always pick up a copy of the Alchemy of Finance. It's a great book. Uh, by Soros, it changed the way that I actually trade. I read it probably a decade and a half ago. I probably refer refer to it at least once a year. Go back and reread it. Um, I really don't care what you think of his politics. I I'm not here for politics. So. If you take a look at Netflix and you watch how this is acting, people say, oh, well, I, I missed it. Okay, so once again, you're telling yourself a story. Did you miss it or do you not know why it's even up, right? And this is what we went over Thursday night a little bit and I want you to understand where I'm going with this. So we're gonna start covering a little bit more of the fundamental uh, side of the market here on some of these videos because I think it's really important for people to get this. Um, and I know that if you're in the community, you already know this, like you, you hear me yammering on about it, but there was a real reason here that when we did this trade that we stayed with it and then people actually added to it uh, that evening at eight o'clock. So if you take a look here, and again, I'll just show you this because it's really important to get both sides of this before we get into it, but the when. So you put an anchored VWAP here for when that news hits and you can just see that we flipped and then you're making a high over that orb. And then it just pushed. It was really, it was a very good report and I don't think people understood it. And then they started to get it a little bit more once you got to the conference call, it never looked back. Overseas trading, they got it. And then from there, we just lifted. And you can even see if we drop a VWAP just on the day from that 930 level right there. Boop, you can see we got right to that. And it's the simplest of things sometimes, guys, to just do the simplest of trades. You stay out of the way if you miss it and the world always gives you another chance and there's your little bar popping up and you could have got right back in there. And this ties all in again to what? What, who, when? You know, what they're doing in the economy right now is meaning high growth names with high gross margins are going to outperform. And if you understood the economic side of that, you would know that you should be looking at high growth names with high gross margins. They're the ones that are going to outperform right now. Now, there's another sector on the flip side that's probably going to continue to outperform. I'll get to that in a moment. If you take a look at how this is playing out, people, oh, I missed it. Uh, did you? Or, or do you not even understand why it did what it did? Okay. And that becomes the access of fundamental analysis and starting to learn this stuff. The fastest way to learn is to listen to the conference calls and listen to the Q&A question. If you start to do that in your free time and know people would be like, oh, I don't want to do that. Well, then don't. Don't do it. 
right? But don't get upset when the thing goes up another 100 points and you don't understand why, right? You don't have to do anything you don't want to. But the idea that there's not value in that is just silly. And you can go back and listen to Thursday. But I'm going to point a couple things out about Netflix so that I can start dripping this stuff on you guys. Guys, in the general sense, because we do have 15% of these videos are actually watched by ladies. If I keep dripping it on you, you'll start understanding why it's so important. So we all know Netflix was a grower. And I'm playing around with the format of these. And I'll see how I can get them better and more effective. But I actually have somebody that's going to start helping me do some more uh, fundamental research uh, doing these graphs and everything. I think it'll be helpful for people to see it in, in line form. But if you if you see what's happening here, you can go, okay, well, this is why Netflix isn't going anywhere. You know, you went down and then we went sideways and then they started this ad business. Well, how's that ad business going? Right? Well, then you're like, okay, so we were at 12 and now we're looking at 18. All right. So the leverage of this company, when it turns and gets going and people don't understand this level, they're not getting this. They're not understanding that this is where it's going, but it's actually even crazier than that. This is why the street went crazy for this name and because the gross margins, if you look at the gross margins, the gross margins are up. Not only are we not talking about net subscribers, which were down, but here's the crazy thing about that. The gross margins are up and it was very clear, and I went over this on Thursday, so I'm not going to do it again, that they're sandbagging the, the gross margin. It's very clear that next quarter is going to be even bigger on the gross margin side and they're making 15% more per person. So when you start to connect those dots, it's very, very clear that the stock was mispriced and it's why institutions are buying it. And the more of this kind of stuff that you know, the more important it is. So just so we're really clear on what you're looking at, gross profit margin on this. So what I'm telling you is that Netflix is now making more money per client than they ever had in the history of their business. There were two really important lines here that I'm going to share with you. And I just want to go through the revenue for a second here. So they expected to deliver 15% revenue growth and six percentage points of operating margin improvement in 24. What was really clear is that this number is being sandbagged and that margins are actually going to be better than expected. Uh, membership growth is going to be up and increase in ARM average revenue per member. They're making more money per member than they ever have. It's actually 15% greater than they ever did per member, which is pretty insane. And I don't think people got this as far as a driver. Netflix sees live programming in addition to core demand content can drive engagement. If they start doing what Amazon did. They buy the Thursday night football game. They start doing something with UFC. Whatever the sports programming is that they have access to, if they start streaming live events, and those live events are there, it's most certainly something that's gonna drive engagement to them. So once again, we have an event where everybody's expecting one thing to happen, something else happens, and then it, it gaps up. The second note I really wanna get on this is gonna be on the technical side. Once you tie in these fundamentals and you understand that these earnings are gonna come out at night, right? You're gonna see a lot of the Freddie Fingers out there on Twitter, on YouTube, and talk about their power earnings gap, okay? And I went over this in detail Thursday again, and we're, I'm not gonna bore you with going over the same stuff over and over again. If you're, if you're new, you may wanna watch that video or just go to that part of it. You want 687 to 763. So the power earnings gap people are waiting for this close and then gonna use this. And there's nothing wrong with that. There's not. Sometimes that happens and that's all you can get. But the people that made money were the people that knew what to look for on that conference call. They knew what to do to go through the earnings. And they're buying here, right? They're buying here. I showed you very clearly on the, on the timestamps where we got in this trade in the community, right? Or the or you can buy here, right? The choice is really yours on whether or not you want to learn this stuff or you don't want to learn it. But don't think that there's not an edge to fundamental analysis and understanding what to look for because there is. And why people are in here trying to figure out how to get in, we're busy selling to them, right? And that's where you want to be. And then you can sit there and go, oh, I'll let it develop. I'll hold a portion. Maybe I'll let it form a three bar pattern. I'll start buying more, right? Now all of a sudden you're in the driver's seat. You're not sitting there going, oh, I really hope that it goes up, right? With everybody else, okay? You're always trying to get an edge. You're fighting for inches here, right? Just think of it that way. Hope this was helpful. Now, a lot of you have talked about swing trades and long-term trading, and that's why I'm starting to show some of this stuff. So again, your comments are greatly appreciated. I read all of them. I try to respond to all of them and I wanna keep them coming. If you find this valuable, please share it and please subscribe to the channel because it helps greatly for the community and I purposely don't wanna run that, which I need to do if I want the algorithms to pick this stuff up so people can learn. But if you share and subscribe and, and comment, it combats that, so thank you. Uh, if you look at XLRE, people are like, why is this boomer talking about REITs again? And I just wanna show this because I think it's really important. I use a 12, a 22, and a 55. You should use what you're comfortable 
compatible with. So I've been yammering on about these REITs and I started yammering on about this one back here. And my comment was really simple. You started to see people take an interest in these names and not just institutional buying, but you had Japan come in and step into the market. I believe it was right around here about a year ago. And they bought 50% of 245 uh, park for $2 billion. When everyone was saying New York's dead, uh, New York's never coming back, you know, boo New York for whatever godforsaken reason. And since then, these companies were trading at huge discounts to book value. I mean, enormous discounts to book value. This thing was had a book value at the time of like $80. And people weren't getting this kind of stuff. So there's another side of this market, where is that really that value side, which is not the momentum side. But if you take a look at like SLG or VNO, and these names that are a part of that New York and where they were trading and where they're at now, the amount of money that you can make off REITs if you truly understand their business and how they trade on valuation is pretty staggering. I would suggest, I'm gonna give you a scan that you can run and look at, and I've ran that scan already and I know which ones I'm looking at, but I'm gonna get into a couple of them. I would run a scan on positive companies, positive cash flow companies that are trading under book value because it literally means someone can go out there and buy all their hard assets. Now there's certain ones you may wanna stay away from uh, when you run those kinds of screens like Medical Properties Trust because they have one big client and they're in the medical field and that client's not really paying them. So you have to do some work on these, but names like Brandywine, which is still trading at 80 cents on the dollar that has earnings coming up and you start seeing this all of a sudden strong interest in something like this before earnings, that's kind of interesting. Like why all of a sudden does everybody have to get in this before that earnings. And I think earnings are coming out in October. Let's take a look at that together. Ah, so you're looking at that on the 22nd when they're coming out and then you're back up here, but now you're 80 cents on the dollar and people will look at this and say, oh, I missed it. But you'll understand that it's still trading at 80 cents on the dollar. So that would mean that someone could literally buy the tangible assets of the company and liquidate it at that price. Hopefully you get where I'm going with this. Kilroy is another example of this where you're, you're still trading at 80 cents on the dollar and people will look at this going from 38 to 43 and saying to themselves, oh, well, I missed it. Well, look at the volume and how this volume has been picking up over time. Okay, you're still at 80 cents on the dollar. Tangible book value, tangible, not what the company's name is worth, tangible, meaning not intangible, meaning things that you can actually touch. Hard assets, meaning I could buy the company and then this is what it's worth. The question becomes, is it profitable or not? So, oh, look, I make money. And then you kind of go through it. Okay, well, we're still making money. We're still making money. So in other words, you can buy a company like this at like 30, when it was trading at 30, you're still probably 20% higher. It's still positive cash flow and it's trading under its book value. And this is really important. I, you know, someone sent me a, a graph that um, the compound did. Ho hold on, I'll show it right here for a second. And uh, I listen to them every once in a while. Every once in a while they got a pretty good guest on or they have some stuff on there. Um, but they're worth listening to, I think. I think that if you're, if you're trying to figure some things out, I think they have a, a good opinion on some things. Uh, he's been around for a long time, Josh. But the, the graph in and of itself makes a lot of sense because what they're saying is, okay, the bear market, pre-bear market high, all right, so here's 46%, they're buying tech, they're buying industrials, and we're killing it here, right? Like the PALs of the world, the GEVs, the GEs, FTAIs, and then of course tech, you get it. Uh, and then you're in this little lull here where discretionary is down, energy is like a nightmare. Every day we're getting free energy, and the next minute there's a new war, so it's a nightmare. But real estate, no one's getting this. And I, you know, again, I saw the graph, I have not listened to this podcast yet, I might if I have the time. Uh, but this to me is just delusional that this stuff is still trading under book value. And this delusion that we're going to lose banks and the unrealized losses. It's just people not understanding really all the connections of all this stuff. So to me, going in there and sorting through the REITs and trying to find the ones that are positive cash flow trading under book value, maybe it's not such a bad idea. Here's an office REIT. Remember, no one's ever gone back to the office again. And here we are at $11 and this thing's still trading at 70 cents on the dollar. Now, I do want to just give you uh, my opinion on trading these things over decades. What? <laughs> What tends to happen is it's a nightmare. And so what I tend to do with it is this. Uh, and I've done this with SLG, but every single time that you're trading these things, it, to me, it's really hard. So I will keep a core. Usually that core is over uh, a line like this. So let's say your position is going to be a thousand shares. This is how I do it. All right, so I'm buying it because I'm over my 55 and I'm all giddy because here we go. I'm buying 50 cents on the dollar, you know, even though it's probably bleeding from every orifice, but I'm like, no, I'm right. All right, so I put my trade on and I buy a thousand shares, okay? What I tend to do then is use like some kind of demarcation line and you can use your own. So, all right, I'll stay in it until, you know, 
we start to lift and then go, okay, I'm doing great. All right, if I close below the 22, I'll close half. Or what percentage you're fine with. All right, so I'm gonna close half if I closed under that. And then if it flips back over, I'll put that half back on. Meanwhile, I'm holding the core until I close under the 55. And then I get out of the core. So let's say that I bought here, I get out of the core. Pops over, it breaks below the core again, I'm out. Okay, I just the way that I do it, where I have a core and then I have the secondary position, because if I try to hold, like we were playing around with this thing since 22 bucks. If I try to hold this thing the entire time with the amount of times that it's cut through the 55 because of how thin, you can see how thin these are. You're gonna, it's gonna be a nightmare, right? So I find having a core position and then trading a, what I will call a secondary or trading position, maybe of equal size, it's up to you, obviously. I'm just telling you what I do. Uh, you will find great value in that because you always have the position on because you know there's a fundamental reason why you own it. Remember the who. And then the technical side of that would be, you know, when I get in and out of the trade. And I find that that kind of strategy with REITs keeps me in them a little bit longer. Apple had excellent news on Friday and they pinned it right to that level, didn't they? They did a great job of just pinning it right to that 235. I'm gonna show you how you could see that coming. So in front of us is a chart. And now this chart is from a site called maxpain.com. It's free and there's other ways to do this and maybe they're a little more nuanced, but this is free. And I prefer to give you something free. You can see the timestamp on it and everything so that you can literally go there yourself and do this. But what you're gonna see here for Max Payne is that here's that wall. And once you see that wall at 235 on a Friday, you have to ask yourself, do those option market makers really wanna pay that off or not? And the bottom line is no, no, they do not. Nothing is even close to that wall. Now you could say, well, what about you know getting to here, right? that's probably like where your backstop is. But what they're trying to do is they're trying to make sure that they don't have to pay out on it. And that's exactly what they did. So while I have an interest in the name, there really makes no sense for me to take a look at. So what I do then is then you wanna look at going to the next week and say, okay, well, what's next week look like? Now, when we look at the next week, we can see, okay, well, that 235, still an issue, but where's their real nemesis at? Well, their real nemesis is going to be that 240 level now. You can just see that they really are not gonna to wanna to pay that. So that does give us leeway here for this to have a fairly good week if it got moving again and understand that we're not gonna have this kind of issue. But maybe on Friday, and I do watch this stuff, it is important because options, they don't wanna pay out. Uh, so what you might wanna do is just watch 240 and how you trade around that and then does the shift because they do shift during the week. Someone might sell these and start rolling them up. And that's where it gets interesting because they're not going to want to pay that. You really don't have any put protection here. So in other words, if this was start to crater, maybe if this increases, you would say, okay, well, they're not going to want to pay under 230. Uh, right now, you would say they would not want to pay under 230. That's really the, the, the crux of it. But you have to watch that 240 level right now. And there's the name of the website. But that starts to make sense why all of a sudden you're in that area and why you can't break out. It's no different than what happened even with something like NVIDIA. And I'll give you some of these that I'm actually looking at. So it's no different than NVIDIA. When you look at NVIDIA and going, well, why can't we break out? Well, if you went and looked at the 140 call wall there, it was absolutely insane. And so was 138 in that area for whatever reason and somebody was pinning to 138. I don't know why that level was so exciting to them, but it was. Uh, but you watch that 140 and you're like, okay, well, going into next week, do I have to worry about that? And the answer very clearly is by taking a screenshot here is no, no, you're at that level where you're at 150. So they're out to 150 and then you would say here, okay, well, here's that 145 level. And then you're going, okay, well, here's 140. So 140 might be an issue. Uh, but then you see you start to get develop a backdrop here on puts as well. So do we have to really worry? Do we have any kind of put protection? Maybe 135, they sure don't want that. They definitely don't wanna pay off on something like that. So you might have to watch that a little bit, but really you understand that, okay, well, 140 might not be as big of an issue next week as it was this past week, okay? And this is on the weekly basis. And I do look at this daily, but it, it is extremely helpful. I actually thought we might get going here after Taiwan Semi's earnings and this might actually continue to push. And you can just see what they did with Taiwan Semi here and how they completely uh, started grabbing this down. I actually bought some puts on that on Friday, <laughs> made a little bit of money. It was kind of fun. Uh, but you can see this, like it would surprise you to watch this gap fill, right? But you might want to go and take a look at something like that on Max Payne. Other levels that I saw that we were able to take advantage of on Friday was just understanding what was going on with MSTR. This was actually perfect, like textbook. Perfect. Um, and it was one of those things where, you know, you're down three. I'm going to show you this pattern very quickly. And I'm probably going to do a, a, I'm probably going to do a video. I am going to do a video on it because it's really important. See how you're up and you have the reversal and then you have the hopes and dreamers. They're bar number two. 
And then bar number three, where like now they realize they're back in the basement eating Hot Pockets. So what they have to do here is understand that you have large, medium, small, right? And what you're getting is you're cleaning those people out. And then all of a sudden you stop. Now you have a doji. Dojis are what? Uncertainty. Once you see the uncertainty, all you want to do is flip. Where you could have seen this is understanding and connecting all this stuff, right? Because if you connect all the stuff we're talking about, end of day, watching the market, et cetera, what you would have seen here right in here on Thursday was this little move in the last half hour. All of a sudden, people have to buy this into the close. And has it been like that, you know, into the close, right? Really? Not not really. No, it hasn't. Matter of fact, it's been the exact opposite. You see how they, they had to get out. We have to get out. And then all of a sudden, it's like, well, you know, let's buy a little bit more. And then you would just overlay your volume and just see, well, all of a sudden they have to get in this. And that bar right there, that's end of day. And so you're looking at that end of day, and again, versus the selling and the selling, and going, okay, well, clearly somebody wants to be in this end of day. This is why the last 10 minutes of the market, market on close are so important, right? And then you just see how we, you know, it went from there and we did quite well with this. But if you look at where you're at now and you go, okay, well, surely there's a wall there that I have to pay attention to. I mean, we're hitting all time highs. I'm sure there's, you know, puts up here and I'm sure that there's, you know, they're gonna be, the, they're gonna watch the 220s and blah, blah, blah. And then you go and take a look at it and you're looking at open interest. I don't care about volume. Volumes, you can look at it, but you care about the open interest because that's what the option market maker does. So where would the option market maker really save his bullets to defend if you were him? It would probably be that 250 level. And then you start going through this and go, well, wait a minute, the other one's 230, right? Okay, well, 222, but you really have to watch these areas and like these 210s and you're like, okay, well, they're already gone. I've already lost, I've already lost there. Right? You already know you've lost that battle because you're over. So you have to figure, okay, well, 220, that's an issue. But if you get over 220, then I can start looking at this 230 level and then go from there. Now, once you tie all this together and you start understanding like the who, the what, the when, and everything we went over here, you start looking for pattern, right? And you might wanna watch one of these two videos because I go over these price action patterns and every single one of these can be used on any time frame. That's it.